Thanks for joining us here today. If this is your first time or you're returning to us, let me encourage you to go to JesusIsTheRock.org. While you're there, give us an update on how God is working in your life. Now, if He's working life change through our ministries, let me encourage you to give to us financially on the website by clicking the giving button at the top right hand corner of the screen. Thank you so very much for tuning in today, and welcome to Church. I want to talk, though, with, uh, I, I'm assuming I missed the announcements this morning, but John mentioned that we won't have service here Wednesday night. Um, as we normally do, we're just really encouraging people to spend that time with their families. And uh, a lot of people are off work then, and so many will be out traveling anyway and things like that. But we just really want to encourage that. Um, this is a week and a day, a time of year that's set aside specifically to give thanks. Now, I've heard people be critical even of this holiday and say, well, I just don't think you ought to have a holiday for it. I think we ought to give thanks every day. So do I. But that doesn't mean that it's wrong. I think it's a great idea that we take a day to set aside, to pause, to remind us to be thankful, to give thanks. You know, and if it takes, if it takes, sure, we should do it every day, but I'm, I'm glad. It's, it's one of my favorite holidays, a time that we can just really pause and take time to say thank you. And what I want to talk about this morning, uh, the title of this message is An Attitude of Gratitude. I kept hearing John speak this morning, and he would say, use the word gratitude, gratitude. Um, so I want to talk about an attitude of gratitude. You know that you can literally change your life by changing your attitude. Your attitude drives your life. Um, shopping online can change your attitude because Walmart can give you. Remember, <laughs> Hank Williams Jr. wrote a song one time talking about an attitude adjustment. And we all need attitude adjustments every now and then. Especially if you're doing Christmas shopping and now you're out in the, you can do all your Christmas shopping online now. You don't have to get an attitude adjustment. In the traffic, we, you know, traffic, I have to constantly check my attitude. Uh, Chuck Swindoll says that life is about 10% what happens to you and about 90% how you handle it. I mean, let's face it, the same things basically happen to all of us, you know? We all get sick. We all have financial struggles from time to time. We all have family that we deal with. We have things that happen in our life. And, 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 and so it's about 10% what happens, and 90% is how we handle how we react to it. In other words, our attitude toward it. For example... Some of you may be inclined to go home tonight and say, oh, I wish I didn't have to get up and go to work tomorrow. That's one attitude. Or you could tonight, before you go to sleep, say, God, thank you that I have a job to get up and go to in the morning. Thank you, Lord. There's so many people that don't have a job that wish. Lord, thank you that I have the health and the ability to get up and go to work tomorrow. There are people who can't go to work tomorrow. They don't have the ability to work. And even if they do, they don't have a job. But God, you've given me the ability to work and a place to go and earn income. Thank you for that. I just want you to know I'm grateful. It's an attitude of gratitude. You can go home today and say, oh, I don't want to clean this house. Uh-huh, I push some buttons. Or you can say, God, thank you that I got a house to clean. God, there's so many people sleeping in the woods and in the park that would love to have a house to clean today. God, they would give anything if they just had a house to clean. It's an attitude of gratitude. It's just the way we deal with things. And we're, we're so quick to gripe and complain about the blessings that God has blessed us with. And so we're going to look at a little example of that this morning in Luke's Gospel, chapter 17. And verse number 11, it says, Jesus continued toward Jerusalem. He reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, 10 lepers stood at a distance crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw he was healed, 
came back to Jesus, shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan, which was basically pagan. It wasn't a worshiper or follower of God necessarily. They were of a foreign descent, wasn't a, weren't, wasn't a Jew. Jesus asked him, didn't I heal 10 men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Now, how does that story make you feel to read it? it to me, it, it sort of gives me different emotions. I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of proud for this one guy. I'm really proud of him that he took time to come back and pause and say, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm proud of him. I'm a little bit angry and ashamed of the nine, the audacity of them that they've just been healed and they don't even take time to thank the Lord. I feel a little sorry for Jesus because we all know what it feels like to be taken advantage of, right? Taken for granted when you've done something and you can't even say thank you. You know, so it, it stirs up a lot of emotions. When you talk about leprosy, it's hard for us to really understand a lot about leprosy because we don't know a lot about it, even though it does still exist today, especially in some third world countries. There, there's still some leper colonies and things, but we don't know a lot about it where, where we live. Probably the closest thing that maybe we could relate to it would be like the disease of AIDS. If someone has AIDS, and it's a, you know, it's a life-threatening disease. Only leprosy would, would be like 10 times worse, both physically and socially, if you can imagine that. Uh, leprosy was a disease associated with sin. It was sort of an outward manifestation of an inward sin. If you had leprosy, well, it was at least believed that it's because you were a sinner. And that was sort of the, the outward manifestation of that. Um, so it was a horrible disease. It, it not only was physically terrible, but it had this stigma attached to it. And to be stricken with this, not, not only is it a death warrant because there is no cure for it, but it also meant that life as you know it is over. I mean, you may as well be dead already. A leper would be driven outside the city gates, away from his family, away from his friends, away from his church, away from everything. And, and if he dared to come into the city for anything, then the law was when he came in, he had to come in shouting, unclean, unclean, I'm unclean. So nobody would get close to him, kind of like I'm doing you this morning. I'm unclean. Don't shake my hand. Don't, don't get near me. But how embarrassing. How degrading that is if you come into town and, and you've got to shout unclean. Don't come near me. I'm an unclean person. And so for that reason, lepers often traveled in groups and they would form what's come to be known as leper colonies. It's little com communities. And because they could stay together because they couldn't hurt each other, they were all dying anyway. And so in the meantime, they sat around and they watched each other literally decay away. I mean, an arm would just, you know, rot away and eventually fall off and a little leg and their whole bodies are covered in sores and pus and infection and it, it's, it's a horrible disease. Now, this particular group of 10 lepers, they had at least heard of Jesus. We don't know how much they knew about him, but they had heard that he healed the sick that he had opened blind eyes and, de and deaf ears and that he had even raised people from the dead. Is there a chance that maybe he could do, you know, probably not, but we got nothing to lose. So they hear that he's coming by. And, and so it said, as he entered a village, 10 leper lepers stood there at a distance. They, 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 they kept the, the law, but they cried out, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. I mean, this is a last-ditch effort. Why not? You know, I'll try anything. And, and it says Jesus looked at them. He stopped and he looked at them. The, the motorcade stops and the president steps out. You know, I mean, Jesus, the kid, he looks at him and he says, go show yourself to the priest. 
okay, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know, but I'm going to do what he says. We got nothing to lose. And it says, as they were going, they noticed they were healed. Can you imagine what a beautiful story this is? This is not a, this is not blind eyes being open or ears being. This is literally being reborn. This is having a second chance at life. What else could you do but run back to Jesus and fall at his feet and say, "Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You've given me life again." And yet we find that out of 10 lepers healed, only one Return to give thanks. One out of ten. See, the truth is this story is not just about Jesus healing ten lepers. Many stories are included in the scriptures of Jesus healing blind eyes or opening deaf ears or healing the sick or raising the dead. And they're put there, I think, primarily to build our faith, to let us know, pray, it's okay. Ask anything of your father. You know, they're, they're there to show us that God heals. This story, I think, is not so. This story is not primarily about healing. This story is about gratitude or the lack thereof. That's what this story's talking about. Now, we can only speculate about the other nine. They're never spoken of again. I must admit, there have been times in my life when I've been so excited about something that I became altogether focused on that which had me excited that I completely miss everything else that's going on. Maybe it's a new job, a new car, a new house, a new relationship. It's new something, something, and it has me so excited, and I'm so excited about the gift that I completely forget about the giver. You ever done that? Or is that just me? I've gotten so focused on, on the blessings that I forget the blesser. So something in, in me wants to try and defend these other nine and say, that has to be what happened. They looked and suddenly they were healed and they couldn't wait to get to their families and their friends. It's understandable. And to get back into society and say, look what happened. What didn't happen, however, is they did not return to give thanks unto God. And what's interesting to me is, is that this genuinely shocks the Lord. There's only a few times in Scripture that the strong implication is given that Jesus is shocked. One is, he's standing there with his disciples one time, and he says, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, others say you're a prophet. And he said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, of all people, speaks up and says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, whoa, Peter. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. But the Father that's in heaven revealed that to you. He said, you got a word from God and it didn't even have to come through me. Peter, upon this rock, you understand? We often think Peter's the rock. No, that's not, that's not what. Upon the ability from, that, that you have to hear from God and it not have to come through me, the fact that you can hear God upon that, I'll build a church. The fact that you can hear from God upon that fact, I'll build a church. That's amazing. You got it. You've been everything that you've learned has had to come through me and come through me. But Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. The Father in heaven told you that. You got it. And then there was a time when he was walking, remembering the, the, the king came to him and said, my child is sick, and will you heal my child? And Jesus said, okay, where's the child? And he said, I'm not even worthy that you come into my house, but if you'll just speak the word, I know my child will be healed. And Jesus jumps back, and he says, wow, I haven't found that kind of faith, not even in Israel, not even among my own people. Shocked. So there's a few times we find, and here I think Jesus is genuinely surprised. He says, wait, what? I thought I healed 10 of y'all. Wasn't there 10? Where's the other nine? Where's the other nine? And so I think that he was shocked, and not only shocked, but I think he was disappointed. And, and I wonder if we ever disappoint the Lord. 
The story's not about healing. The story's about being thankful and grateful for what God has done for us. Have you ever noticed that with, with children sometimes that the, the more you give them, the less they appreciate what they already have? Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that it's not just children? <laughs> sometimes the more we get, the more we come to expect. Sometimes overwhelming abundance and blessings can sometimes breed insensitivity and unthankfulness and ungratefulness. With kids, we call it being spoiled. With adults, sometimes we call it a feeling of entitlement. I deserve this. I earned this. I worked for this. I've worked hard. I'm entitled to these abundant blessings. And when I'm abundantly blessed, it seems that I can be annoyed by the smallest of things. You get, you get some couple that, you know, they work, live paycheck to paycheck, and they have to turn the air conditioner off because they only got a quarter of a tank, and they got four days to payday, you know, and so we got to roll the windows down, you know, and no, no extras. We got one jar of peanut butter and a half a loaf of bread. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, it's, it's still got a week to week to payday. It's amazing the things that does not annoy them. It's amazing the things that they just live with every day and they're just things that don't. But, but sometimes you, you get when we're in a very green place, we come to expect green everywhere and the least little brown annoys us. These folks, you know, they're like, they're like the old man, remember that, that he had lived in the country all of his life, never been to, been, never been to town. His daughter's come and, and, and they take him to town and they take him to the mall. He'd never been to a mall before and he goes and he looks around all day. They go from shop to shop and he's amazed this big place. And at the end of the day, she says, Dad, what do you think? And he says, it's amazing. Never have I seen so many things in one place I could do without. <laughs> See, that's, that's contentment. That's contentment. Most of us, hopefully, are praying people. We pray for the sick, that they'll be healed. We pray for financial blessings. We, we pray for the salvation of our loved ones. We pray for jobs and and. and you know, maybe you've gotten in a bind and you've asked God for help. We pray all, at least I hope we do. We, we pray all the time. But, but let me ask you, say, maybe over the last month, can you even remember all the things you've asked God for? I can't. I really can't. Can you remember all the answers you got? I can't. See, we pray for we pray for situations in our life. God, I need this, Lord. I need you to do this. God, heal Sammy. God, get him out of this hospital. Raise him up. We need a miracle, God. We need you to touch him. We need you. And then we come through victorious. And God raises him up and does that. What do we do? We move on to our next prayer request. That's why I like to stop and just say, let's give God praise for Sammy. Let's just give God praise. Lord, we just thank you for a walking, talking, bona fide miracle. Thank you that doctors looked on and said, doctor in medical science can't do it. If it does it, if he gets out of here, it's going to take a miracle. Well, it's a miracle we got. And so we just give God glory. We just pause. But so many times we get, we get the miracle. We get the victory. God answers our prayer. And then it's on to the next prayer request. And it's a never-ending list of things we want God to do and we expect God to do. And this, is, this is my point. This frightens me that perhaps we've become so blessed that we cannot even recount the blessings. We can't even remember the blood. We've been so cared for and protected and hovered over, we can't even remember or recall the answered prayer probably in the last week. 
we've forgotten to say thank you. I just wonder how many people on this, this day that's been set aside specifically make no bones about it. We call it Thanksgiving. And how many people, it'll be more about football games and turkey and dressing and who brings what and I got to go see this person again and than it will pausing and stopping to say, thank you, God, for all you've done for me yet another year. God, you have blessed me. And just to recount, somebody said something this morning about making a gratitude list. Just maybe it would be fun to sit down with a family and just, just start writing down the things God has done for us this year, the blessings that God has bestowed upon us, you know. I mean, we call it Thanksgiving. And yet how many people will not even think about giving God thanks this year? When I see these nine lepers forgetting to return and say, thank you, my first thought is to say of all the nerve, how ungrateful. And then I think of me and my blessings and my unfaithfulness. We, we see our children grab a new toy or a new bicycle and take off to play without even saying thank you. And we think, can you believe that? They didn't even say. And I think, yeah, I wonder where they learned that from. And when your wife forgets to say thank you for getting up and going to work and providing a home for us, and you think, boy, they're just un ungrateful and they take me for granted. And, and may maybe so, but when's the last time you said thank you for being a good wife? Thank you for helping raise our children and doing this. The, my, my point is how quick we are to point out in others the lack of gratitude while we ourselves may be guilty of the same thing. See, it's so easy to read a story like this and say, you dirty, rotten dogs. You nine people didn't even. It's so easy for us to see that. Our, I mean, we, we can be so critical of these nine But I find myself more embarrassed or convicted than I do critical. I hope this lesson makes me more aware of the daily provisions that God so faithfully blesses me with. Not just the things he blesses me with, but even the things that he keeps me from. Sometimes I just have to get up and I just have to say, God, thank you for the accident I didn't have on the way to church today. God, I thank you for the cancer that's not living in my body. I thank you for the funeral that I didn't have to go to for my child this year. God, I thank you for the things that you have kept me from that I'm not even aware of. Situations that you've kept me out of. Don't ever allow your miracles to become commonplace. If you're sitting here today and you got breath in your body, the psalmist said, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let me close with this. Maybe, maybe you've gotten married or you had a birthday or somebody brought you a present or did something special for you. You know, one of the first things we do, hopefully, we sit down, we write a thank you note. Thank you for thinking about me. Thank you for doing this. Because why? We want that person to know, I appreciate what you did for me. That was, that was special. We, want, we care about what they think. How much more should we care about what God thinks? Don't we care about what he thinks? I don't want God to be disappointed. I don't want God to be looking and saying, but where's Roger? Where's Rodney? I mean, this person's over here blessing him and thanking him, and he says, thank you, your faith has made you. But where's Roger? Didn't I bless you? Didn't I? Where, you know? We care. We ought to care about what God thinks. I want the Lord to know that I'm thankful. If I go to the mailbox and I get out a thank you note, somebody says, thank you for preaching my dad's funeral, or thank you for this, or thank you for doing that. You know, I say, what? That makes me feel good, you know, because they cared, cared enough to sit down and write a thank you note. Don't you know the Bible says that God inhabits the praise of his people? How many times has God run to the mailbox and open it up and all there is is a stack of 
prayer requests. And he's like, weren't there nine? Haven't I done 900,000 things today? Is there not one that says thank you? Even God likes to be praised. But all he gets is another prayer request. Jesus said, were there not ten lepers, but only one's return? God, give us an attitude of gratitude. How many of us have just been so unusually blessed? When I look around and I see, you know, we got all of this Syrians that's trying to get into the country, and you got people says, let them in, people says, don't. You know, but they're trying to get where we are. And most of us were fortunate enough to be born. This country, with all of its troubles, is still a thousand times better than other places. And we live here, and we take it for granted every day, the freedoms that we have and the blessings that we have. Will we not pause to say, God, thank you for how the unusual many blessings you've blessed us with? I hope that every day, but especially this day that's coming up, that it'll be more about than something, you know, with football or turkey or even family gatherings. I hope that we'll pause to say, Lord, I just want to stop and thank you for all of your blessings on me. It'll please the Lord. It'll please the Lord. It's not empty words. God inhabits the praise, inhabits me. He loves the praise of his people. He likes to hear. Well, doesn't he know it anyway? He knows my heart. Yeah, but you know, I can know, I can know that you love me, but sometimes I want to hear it. Sometimes somebody just comes and says, Pastor, I just want you to know I love you. Oh, that just makes me feel good. It makes us all feel good. We like to be praised. So does God. Amen. Again, we are incredibly glad that you joined us here today at Church of God. I encourage you to go to the website. There you can find any of our archive podcasts. You can send us an email about how God's working in your life or a prayer request. Or you can give to our ministries financially by clicking the giving button at the top right hand corner of the screen. Have a blessed day.